Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've chosen to join us. As you may know, we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And right at the moment, we're going through the lessons for the first quarter of 2013. This is lesson number three in that series entitled, The Creation Completed. And it's talking about days three, four, I'm sorry, day four, five, six, and seven of Creation Week. Grab your Bible and we'll look at those things together, but as we're preparing, let's, let's ask the Lord to guide us with a word of prayer. Our loving Father, as usual, we ask your special guidance and direction as we talk about these very significant matters in Scripture. Forgive us if we have misunderstood and misrepresented you in any way. We find the stories of creation fascinating, full of provocative questions, and help us to raise those good and correct questions today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as many have suggested, uh, the first three days of Creation Week were about the forming of our world, and now in the, the, the rest of the three days, not counting the rest day of Sabbath, the next three days, days four, five, and six, are the filling of those uh, that form that had been created in the first three days. Um, as we all know, there is no astronomical or other scientific basis for the seven-day week. Basically, months follow the phases of the moon. We all know that, more or less. Not exactly. One year is a time for Earth to orbit around the sun. Individual days are determined by the spinning of Earth. So you would say, well, you know, such phenomena must be determined by astronomical something or other. But the seven-day cycle, what is the astronomical thing that determines that? There isn't any, any. Well, why did God choose to make a seven-day cycle and call it a week? The Sabbath commandment in Exodus 20 makes it clear that God intended for six days to be set aside for human labor, but the seventh day was to be preserved as a rest day and a day of celebration in the worship of God. When God made his children, us, does he have a six-in-one rhythm in? No, I don't think so. Well, why the six-in-one, six-in-one? Six you work, one you rest. Um, there seems to be that, that cycle seems to be in other things, too, when they mark God. Even the, even the, the dragon has seven heads. Mm-hmm. And um, there there's might. a lot of sevens there's all over the place. There's a lot of sevens place, in the Bible. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't have anything to do with time. No. Maybe we haven't discovered it yet, but there is something. Because people who go to church, um, sometimes they're healthier and they have the six and one, six and one. I'm not, I'm not sure about, you know, six and one or anything like that. But I know that when France kind of uh, forsook the Lord, and, and move to atheism, they even wanted to change the seven-day week. And my understanding is they changed it to a 10-day week. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was everyone started getting sick. It didn't work. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. And here we are, the world we follow a seven-day week. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to work very well. Mm -hmm. Ellen White has some comments about the Sabbath, which we'll discuss in more detail a little bit later. She says, had the Sabbath been universally kept in celebration of the creation week we're talking about now, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship. And there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. Never. That's very interesting. Provocative. Now, the, the Jews kept Sabbath. Mm-hmm. They had plenty of those kind of people. They didn't keep Sabbath during those times, though. Yeah. When they had well, the idols. Well, even even when they even well, when they um, did keep it, they still had those people. Well, but don't don't make the mistake of trying to paint them all with the same brush. You know that there are very conservative Jews and there are very radical Jews, and but still, I'm still I'm trying to put that together with what she said. Mm -hmm. That's, that's all I'm doing, saying is I. Yeah. And and well, I still I still absolutely believe it. I think that if and even when they were keeping it, it was for the wrong reason. Yeah. 
So, uh, and I don't think that's what's included in here. If the thoughts and affections would have been there, there were certainly no affections. They were keeping that so that they could get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. Well, even before we were created, God recognized that man would need this time of rest and time for building a relationship with him. And you remember the famous verses in Mark 2, 27 and 28. Have a look at those. And Jesus concluded, the Sabbath was made for what? Man. The good of human beings, my version says. He, it was made for man. They were not made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. If the Son of Man is Lord over humanity, he's also Lord over what? The Sabbath, right? So what is that saying? What do you think it says? No, I asked you. Well, <laughs> what is that saying? The if you're Lord over something, how are you Lord well, over it? it? It says several things, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but, or we may. But it, it's clear that our world has a daily cycle that's unlike any other place that we know in the universe. Yes. So our six days and one day, unless there's some other world somewhere that have a similar pattern, we just don't know. But as far as we know, this, the Sabbath fits our world. It belongs to our world. It was made for us. And God says, and I choose, I'm, in the future, I'm going to make my headquarters in the world, headquarters of the universe. I'm going to make it here on this earth. And I'm going to follow that pattern. But why is the Lord Lord of the Sabbath? Well, if he's Lord of everything on earth, doesn't that make him also Lord of the Sabbath? Because the yeah, Sabbath but, and everything but, in heaven. But what would he, what would he exercise for, for being Lord of the Sabbath? What could he be exercising okay. as being Lord of the Sabbath? Okay. He is, the, he is the, the, the being that we worship on that day. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, he, he, as creator, as one who designed a system in which these beings were going to to operate. He would be the one who lords it over them and tells them, here is the system in which you were created. You will do best if you live within this system. Mm -hmm. And I am the one who created it. I'll tell you how things are. Well, that's what I was thinking. Maybe, maybe people were thinking that the Sabbath was lorded in over everybody. And then, and then he, the comeback to that would say, no, the, the Lord is the Sabbath. The Lord is Lord over the Sabbath. Even. If he is Lord over humanity mm -hmm. in general, and then he makes something that is for that humanity, then he is Lord of yeah. both. Well, another thing regarding the Sabbath, uh, for the slaves, because they had, they got, they were able to have to use one day where they were able to rest. Another phenomenon is the dirt, the earth. In places like, let's say, Porto in Haiti, where people are, they just keep using the, uh, the dirt without letting it rest. And people who work it for six years or, uh, and leave it alone, let it, the earth would give them what they want. But after they keep using it and use it with no rest, it's just dead. They yeah. cannot grow anything, even Monto Cento. I'm saying it, the name wrong. That company, Monsanto. that okay, and they went there. They cannot do, and they do mutation and all this. They tried everything with those dirt that they don't let rest. They cannot do anything with it. <laughs> Amazing. Now, thing. now, though, though, when Jesus said that, made that statement that he is Lord over the Sabbath, wasn't he saying that in the context of the Sabbath oppressing people? Yes. Mm -hmm. That it well, was. It was. Mm -hmm. That's that's my point there. You just how. Um, it sounds to me like, uh, he, listen, people, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Don't let it oppress you. Mm -hmm. Well, coming back to our Genesis story, we start with verse 14. Genesis 1, verse 14. Then God commanded that lights appear in the sky. Notice again, let lights appear. Okay? Let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night and to show the time when days, years, and religious festivals begin. They will shine in the sky to, let, to give light to the earth, and it was done. So God made the two larger lights, the sun and the, to rule over the day, and the moon to rule over the night. He also made the stars. 
He placed the lights in the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and the night, and separate light from darkness. God was pleased with what he saw. Evening passed and morning came. That was the fourth day. Okay, what does that teach us? Well, the fourth day is one of the ones that has raised more questions than probably any other day in, in uh, the, the days of creation. How can you have light made on the first day and you got the sun, moon, and the stars made? Notice here it didn't say made. It says that he let them appear on the fourth day. Job 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They could have just as well been out there Mm -hmm. But the earth was covered in darkness and, and thick uh, uh, clouds. Thick clouds, yeah. And so he turns, uh, it removes part of the uh, clouds, or you suggested earlier, maybe cause the earth to spin. But let, let's say the earth was already spinning, but it, it wasn't quite as dense. Mm -hmm. I, like I said earlier, in the middle of the summer, I've seen the, the street lights come on in the middle in midday. Because of the uh, thunderstorms. And you were unable to see the sun, huh? Oh, it, it, absolutely. I was in Chicago. But when the clouds cleared, you saw the sun. Yeah, but we go out on a foggy morning. We know it's, it's, it's morning. However, but we still can't see the sun. <laughs> However, it's just as possible that what he created during this creation week is what we view as our universe. Or our galaxy. I mean, our... Not our galaxy, our solar system. No, our universe. Mm -hmm. the, anything that we can see, no matter how far away. Mm -hmm. And that we are just parallel to some other universe that has been created at some other time. That's way well, out. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah, the creator the, cr has credit for having done so. I mean, yeah, I mean, he gets the credit for making it. Yeah, it, was, it was not self-existent. It didn't evolve and so forth. Well... The common sources of light for our world today, as we know, are the sun, the moon, and the stars. More than that, there's a special challenge for those who want to make each day into a long time period. If plants were created on the third day, but the sun and the moon were not created or not, did not appear until the fourth day, what sort of light sustained those plants for the proposed long periods of time until the fourth day? That's the point. Okay? Furthermore, what was the basis for the evenings and mornings of the first three days if the sun was not created until the fourth day. That's just one of the arguments against theistic mm -hmm. evolution as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have no independent observer to answer these questions for us. We've already mentioned that God is light, Revelation 21, 23, etc. Perhaps God's presence during the, li during the light time of the day provided the light for the first three days. Another possibility is that on the fourth day, God assigned their major functions assign their major functions to the sun, the moon, and the stars, saying, sun, you're the, the light of the day, moon, you're the light of the night, etc. Maybe that's what happened on the fourth day. Another um, Hebrew scholars such as C. John Collins say that the wording in Genesis 1.14 could allow for either of these possibilities. I'm inclined more to a third possibility that might be easier to understand is that the sun and the moon were already in existence but they were obscured by clouds or possibly volcanic dust and were not fully visible until the fourth day. Because remember, it, it says, let the sun, the moon, and the stars appear, right? On the fourth day. He gave it a tune-up. I say, he gave it a tune-up. Well, are we willing to live with the idea that we do not know all the answers? We better. We have to. <laughs> Think of all the scientific mysteries present even today for which we do not have complete answers. We do not throw out science just because we do not have all the answers. We should not throw out the Bible just because it does not give us all the answers. Mm. So now we go to the next day, Genesis 1, starting from verse 20. Then God commanded, let the water be filled with many kinds of living beings, and let the air be filled with birds. So God created the great sea monsters, all kinds of creatures that live in the water, and all kinds of birds. And God was pleased with what he saw. He blessed them all and told the creatures that live in the water to reproduce and to fill the sea. And he told the birds to increase in number. Evening passed and morning came. That was the fifth day. Notice the things that were created on this day filled the space created on the second day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can we agree that on the first day he created the element of light and on the fourth the s he showed the sources of it? Maybe. Sure. Also, also along those lines, 
as, as Ken was saying earlier, perhaps they were just hidden because there was light, there was a morning, there was an evening on each of these days. Yes. So some form of light came through during the daytime and, and there was some darkness. Well, God was present. Yes. He's light. Yes. Well, can you imagine the creative mind of God mm. or Jesus who actually did this to think of all these creatures, mm -hmm. to think of a lion and a chicken and a dog and a mm -hmm. and giraffe, a fish, and I mean, it's just amazing. And it's, it's some of these animals, you go to the zoo and you think God sort of ran out of things to do, and so he made them really bizarre, no. really <laughs> bizarre. Uh, some of the sea creatures yes. that look like leaves or they look like pieces of seaweed, and then all of a sudden they move, and I mean, they're just incredible. True. Um, there's nothing in the record, in the fossil record, nothing at all to suggest um, that we started with just one individual and then a, or a pair of individuals give rise to many different types later. Uh, clearly, the narrative here says God made a whole bunch, a lot of them. Uh, these people that suggest it wasn't God, are they afraid or are they concerned that there is something bigger and mightier than them that yes. they're going to have to report to yes. for their lives? Very and much And they so. would just as soon logic it out of their mind? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there's people that just don't believe in God. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's because they're scared of anything. They know they're going to die. Yesterday, yesterday mm -hmm. I was on TV. There was a, an atheist being interviewed. <clears throat> And he was uh, decrying some of the other atheists who were <laughs> acting like it was like they're uh, were trying to get rid, were trying to make their own religion. In other words, trying to get rid of the of the manger scene in a in a town. Well, why should atheists? Go? He said, "I'm an atheist because I don't want to be bothered with Christianity. But if somebody wants to have a manger scene, that's fine with me." <laughs> yeah. So he was railing against the the others. But you're right; they just I don't want it. Well, it seems much more likely that when God created the original forms, he made them capable of producing a lot of variety. I mean, think about it. There are more than 400 named breeds of pigeons. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of variety, named varieties of dogs. There are 27 breeds of goldfish. And how did all that happen? Well, we know, we know that many of these creatures have something inside of them that allows them to adapt and move back and forth. The, the, uh, the moths that go from white to gray or black, depending upon their environment. And then the birds, the same species of birds, within a generation or two, can develop a different type of uh, length of beak. It doesn't mean that they've evolved into a different creature. The, if you take some of the insects yeah. and you put them down in a cave where there's no light, within a few generations they have no eyes. Mm -hmm. their, their, their eyes disappear. Well, you know, the problem you is, oh. put the generations back in light and they come back. The eyes come back. <laughs> the eyes come back. Yes. Yeah. Well, we're coming to the Christmas season and this is going to be after the Christmas season, but we're going to have family reunions. Just look at all the family members and wonder, I'm related to all of them. I know in mm -hmm. our family, they go from five foot to six foot four, and Any, uh, uh, all shapes and sizes. At, at Thanksgiving and Christmas time, many family members do wonder that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm related to them? Yes, yes. I'm just joking. Yeah. I'm just but joking. So we talk about the <laughs> animals having different uh, uh, you just, varieties. You just described microevolution, though. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, you just it's variation. It's nobody not likes evolution. to There's use yeah. that that word evolution. And it's evolution, not evolution just means change. Yeah. But we're no. but but the point is that we've got all these species. Um, if you talk about an arc, if you took if there wasn't any change, you couldn't put all those species in the arc. There's no way. Yeah. 
So when, the, when they left, who, whatever form they were then, they did change. There's no doubt about it because you, I don't think you could even fit all the pigeons in the ark. You yeah. know, but an evolution back, that says that an amoeba came became a person. No, that's but that's what they call macro evolution. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's a different. But a dog is still a dog is a dog, and a cat is still a cat is a cat. But they change. They change. Yeah, fuzzy you got cat. You've got Siamese a, cats. You've got yeah. regular tab, tabby cats. You got. Yeah. They're different. They are different. They not only no change, down they not only change on their own now, we're making them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Some scientists in Mexico created mix, not just, that's what we talk about, species, separate species. They, sp they did a winner dog, you know, those long ones, mm -hmm. with a cat, the ugliest thing you've ever seen in your life. It's, I mean, it's frightening just to look at it, but oh. they've done it. That's and you mentioned one time about um, gravity. They're doing that too. They're making gravity. They're using a machine to pull gravity to change the, yeah. its direct, mm -hmm. um, the men have A number of years ago, someone noticed that the, that the genome of cabbages and, and, and uh, radishes are almost exactly the same. So they said, what, what if we try to see if we can crossbreed cabbages and radishes? And um, so they worked and they got something to grow. Now, man, this is bar. You know, they said, Let's, we'll have a nice cabbage on top and we'll have a radish on the bottom. The whole thing will be edible. And what they got was the bottom of the cabbage and the top of the radish. <laughs> 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 Serves them right. <laughs> I think they may have done some of that. I heard that the mm -hmm. human and the monkey and the banana are very close together. Well, you and can I, take even the corn, yeah. And I, and I think that's it's how we got some of our folks in Washington, D.C. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well joking. let's go back. <laughs> While evolutionists suggest that the first creatures developed in the sea and finally crawled out, crawled out on a dry land as amphibians and later developed into reptiles and birds, we note that birds have a number of amazing adaptations that are not seen in any other creatures. Bird feathers are lightweight and strong, stiff, yet flexible. The individual portions of each wing are held together by tiny barbs that brace the feather. Lungs of birds were designed for very rapid intake of oxygen. Even their bones have air sacs which can provide additional surface area for absorption of oxygen. And at the same time, birds have bones much lighter than animal, animals' bones. And that makes them so they can fly easily. So let's take on the next day because we need to keep moving. Look at Genesis 1, starting with verse 24. Then God commanded, Let the earth produce all kinds of animal life, domestic and wild, large and small, and it was done. So God made them all, and he was pleased with what he saw. Then God said, Now we make human beings, and we'll talk about how God created human beings in a, in a later lesson, because that's a very special uh, issue. Um, we also notice that some, that just as God created a variety of forms on the fifth day, he created animal life, domestic, wild, large and small, on the sixth day. And each of these, those creatures was clearly capable of producing a variety of offspring. One of the expressions in Genesis 1 that has created considerable discussion is the expression, according to their kind. Mm -hmm. It's in verse 11, verse 21, 24, and 25, if you uh, have one of the more traditional translations. What do you think that means? I think you can interbreed and play with the species in that specific species. Okay. I, I, I don't, don't know that it equates it. to a species category. Does it? Our, our current definition of species, but it, it probably was something that uh, was unique enough, but had sufficient design variability in it. Uh, well, the Bible was written way back, and the ancient Greeks, you know, and, and let's just say up front that it's clear that this type was not intended to be anything equivalent with our, let's say, a genus of our right. taxonomy today. In ancient Greek philosophy, it was believed that God originally created types as a, as a non-changing ideal. Each individual would then be an imperfect expression of that original type. So there's a perfect bird, and then all the other birds are, tr are, are, are not perfect, but they, they keep trying to get as close as possible to that original ideal. But that is clearly not consistent with, with what we read in scriptures. For example, 
there were the results of sin. Uh, Romans 8, 19 to 22 talks about how, you know, well, let's just look at that. Let's just look at it. Romans 8. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. And when did that happen? When Adam and Eve sinned, right? Yet there was the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. Mm. And Ellen White uh, talks about a threefold curse on the earth as a result of Adam and Eve's sin first, then Cain's murder of Abel, and then finally the flood. You read about that in Volume 4 of Spiritual Gifts, page 121, and Volume 1 of the Bible Commentary, page 1085, paragraph 6. But was that God pronouncing something when you talked about the curses? I don't know that she says that per se, but she says that cu curses resulted. The curses resulted. Mm -hmm. Well, that's bad things. Yeah. Basically, curses and, are and bad things. Let's just let's just add specifically: were parasites and predators, which cause so much suffering and violence in our world today, present in their current form back at creation? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No, we don't think so. I mean, were all the diseases there? Have lions always been predators, carnivores? Uh, how could that be? Yeah, exactly. In volume three, Ellen might say, but if there was one sin above a, another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of men and beasts which defaced the image of God mm. and caused confusion everywhere. God purposed to destroy by a flood that powerful, long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. Mm. Yeah, well, you, if you look up on her desk and look up amalgamation, it looks like she took that out. Mm. So well, yeah. don't take that too, because there, there's a lot of issues about racism too with that. And there's a lot of detail. There's a lot of detail in the earlier books where that she talks about to an Adventist audience, which she moves when she writes books for the general audience. You no, but getting, no, you but you need to draw a big conclusion. But there was that. a big conclusion, though, because they she took it out of the books for Adventists, even. You so, were getting to your own kind, but you flushed yes, it off. What? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna get back to it right now. Look at Genesis. Look at some verses. Genesis six nineteen and twenty. Take into the boat with you a male and a female of every kind of animal and of every kind of bird in order to keep them alive. So there's another use of the word kind. Look at Genesis 7:14. With them went every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, and every kind of bird. Uh, look at Leviticus 11. This is talking about clean and unclean animals. Uh, all winged insects are clean except those that hop. You may eat locusts, crickets or grasshoppers, but all other small things that have wings are also, and also crawl must be considered unclean, and so forth. And it, uh, all, this expression, all winged insects are unclean, it says something about kinds in, in, the, in the traditional translations. These verses can help us to understand that kinds, as used in the writings of Moses, to mean something more like groups. What were created on the sixth day were a wide variety of creatures, each with Plural potentiality. How do you like that word? What does it mean? That means Variation. each each animal has the potential for developing a well, like a one dog. There was probably one pair of dogs dogs in the ark. But look at how many varieties we have today. Human beings were also created on the sixth day, and we will study the details of that account later. The entire sequence was then followed by a day of rest. Of course, God did not rest because he was tired. Rather, he rested because he was finished with his work. The Hebrew word used for rest is Shabbat, which, of course, is the word from which we derive our word Sabbath. God set aside and blessed this seventh day because he intended it for it to be a continuous time of celebration with his children. In this context, it's important to notice the Sabbath was made for us, the verse we looked at earlier in Mark 2, and not, a, not because God had some special need. God didn't make the Sabbath just so that he could enforce upon us, you know, you've got to do this because I say so, because I need somebody to worship me. No, it was made for our benefit. God knew that worshiping him 
was one of the very most important things that we can do. For us. For us. For ourselves. This should be immediately obvious from the fact that our particular seven-day cycle and each individual day are determined by our relationship to our sun and not related to any other astronomical phenomenon in any other part of the universe that we know about. Additionally, Sabbath was man's second day. Remember, if, if God set us to, you know, to go according to theistic evolution at, at day one, uh, we were created, and we're supposed to celebrate every seventh day, we ought to be worshiping on Friday. Hmm? You know, God oh, well, there, but, but Friday evening begins the Sabbath. Yeah, yeah well, but, but think about this. The Sabbath was our second day. Right. So what, what would have been our seventh? If we were made, if we were wound up and we were supposed to go bing every seventh day, that should be, depending on how you count the days, that should be either Thursday or Friday. One day back, right. Yeah. And then seven. You know, well, that's why it's the Lord's Sabbath. It's mm -hmm. not our Sabbath. Exactly. We, we, we worship on But it was Sabbath. made for us. Yes. Now, regarding that yeah. scripture in Mark, some people say that throws the Sabbath out. We're no longer, uh, we do not need to adhere to it because the Sabbath was made for us. We were not made for the Sabbath. But it sounds to me like that was a gift mm -hmm. for us from God. And I learned as a small child, uh, don't refuse someone's gift. Mm -hmm. If you refuse their gift, they're less likely to give you more gifts in the future. Mm -hmm. And here God has given us a gift, and it's the Sabbath. He made it for us. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, God is an orderly and systematic person. Yes. And I know that I came into the Sabbath because I just went to church on Sunday or didn't go to church at all. And when you start becoming a Sabbath person, you have to organize your life. And, and I think God does that. You have to get ready. And then uh, there's like the, sort of the day of preparation. Mm -hmm. And then um, you're supposed to break from everything and enjoy uh, fellowship and potlucks and Bible study and Worship. just rest the day, maybe sleep a little or go out in the country or something like that. And then Monday you go back to your system. And it was just a phenomenal experience uh, to put that rhythm in a life. And I actually felt that during the six days that you work, that you actually get better ideas. Mm -hmm. And um, if you pay attention, I mean, you can s be lazy like anything else, but you actually get more done. Mm -hmm. But it's a complete reorganization of your life. And I figure that God is organized and he wants his children to be organized and he wants his children to have good ideas. And so he's saying, come rest with me, get away from everything. And you will actually have better ideas when you go back yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. Ken, what would happen if um, we only had the Sabbath and Deuteronomy? <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about that right now. So thank you for bringing it up. God not only set aside the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. By the way, before we leave that and talk about his question, how would God, if, if God created all these things as we have suggested here, suggested by Genesis 1, how do you think God would best like us to celebrate the Sabbath is, as a memorial of his creation? It's kind of a birthday party. Mm -hmm. The birth of of the mm -hmm. world, the birth world. of the trees and the atmosphere and, and the, the animals and the humans. Mm -hmm. It's a party. It's, it's a memorial. Okay. The Sabbath also was a celebration of freedom from slavery, and that's Deuteronomy 5. It's a celebration of God's plan of salvation signified by the death of Jesus and his resting in the grave over that, that Sabbath. And finally, it will be a celebration of, of an anticipation of our future home in heaven and the new earth where we will continue to worship on the Sabbath, Isaiah 66, 23. Look at that for a second, just a second. Isaiah 66, 23. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. And he's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. So... God has not only given us a Sabbath to celebrate creation, what else are we supposed to celebrate? Freedom from slavery, the plan of salvation, our future home. 
all the major things that he has done. And freedom from slavery is freedom from sin. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't the Sabbath in Deut Deuteronomy actually talking about a different Sabbath? No. Why would you say that? Because we're talking about the Passover Sabbath, because that's the Sabbath that celebrates freedom from the, the Egyptians. And if you look at it, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day Sabbath. Mm -hmm. There's right. one, it starts at the beginning day. In. Okay, so, so we've got a whole bunch of Sabbaths, and you even, you even define it as a day of finishing. So uh, there's a lot of finishing happening that day. I mean, Sabbaths are memorializing a lot of finishing. So um, where, in the w where in Deuteronomy would it tell you that you need to do the weekly Sabbath? Well, the reason I'm quite certain it's a weekly Sabbath is because if you compare Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, they are virtually word for word until you get back down to that reason for celebrating the Sabbath. But doesn't that make doesn't that make a point that you need to look at? I mean, it's making it different right there. So there's got to be a reason why it's different. Yeah, it's God is adding reasons to the Sabbath. I mean, More reasons why we should celebrate. Everything in the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy and and what's the other one? Exodus. 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 Everything's the same except for the fourth commandment where, where it tells you why the we... The fourth commandment is all the, the same Sabbath. except for the reason. Yeah, except for the reason. In other words, you're not supposed to keep a different Sabbath. It's the same Sabbath. It's just you give a different reason for keeping it. Uh, yeah, but it, it doesn't say that, though. It doesn't say that. You're, you're putting that in No, but, but if, you, if you're trying to say it's a celebrating a different Sabbath, you're making a much bigger leap than well, if what you... What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath comes 14 days after the first moon. That's the Passover Sabbath. And that's, and, and that's celebrated with bitter herbs and, and roasted lamb and, and so forth. We're talking about the, the um, being released from... Sure. So that's Once what it would be pointing to. Uh, the Deuteronomy is one, pointing to one that one. One could be... Now, this, this may sound funny, but in, in language terminology, maybe one could be determined as a Sabbath, and there could be another one which is no, I, the I, Sabbath. I, I think we, we have forgotten the wording. Let me read to you again the wording of that fourth commandment in Deuteronomy. This is Deuteronomy 5. I'm starting with verse 12. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a rest dedicated to me. On that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that I, the Lord your God, we rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I commanded you to observe the Sabbath. You know, not Samuel, fits exactly the Feast no, of Unleavened Bread. No, it does not. Yes, it does. Not, so not at all. No. Not a chance. Verse 13. Verse 13. Because this is the, the you Feast have of Six the, days in which to do your work. It's the Passover. The Passover is a once a year thing. This is every six. This is every right. seven no, days. No, but the one in Deuteronomy doesn't say anything about a week. But it I does absolutely. Didn't you hear? I said it said six days read. to do your work. Six, verse seven 13. days of Sabbath on verse the Feast of Unleavened Leaven Bread. It lasts for seven days. Now, right? Samuel, one has one has a Sabbath at the end there. Yes, I mean, well, wouldn't I mean, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread be the entire thing? Wouldn't that be a Sabbath? It is a Sabbath. So, the, the so there, Sabbath. yeah, that's right. So this is clearly talking about a weekly Sabbath. In, in but if the you verse look 13. at if you look at how you are supposed to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're supposed to work, do light labor for six days, and on the seventh day you're supposed to dress no, no, completely. No, 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 no. The the Passover happens first, and then. There's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it's, it's completely backwards from the, now, the way the Sabbath is. Samuel Bakioki, I, I saw him talk several times, and he's an expert, and, and he said, the Sabbath is the weekly Sabbath. And when other Sabbath names, it's never the Sabbath. It's like Sabbath or a Sabbath or something like that. But okay, that's you're going to have to say that. You're going to have to find that in the Bible to yeah. where it points it out. That points it out. Well, well, I'm not going to take what he says. You're going to have to go to the Bible and figure it out there. Well, he got it from the Bible. 
Well, but I mean, you might think about that. This is the Sabbath, and this is not a Sabbath. We're, well, we, need, we have a lot more things to talk yeah. about. One of the biggest questions that has been raised about the events of creation in recent times is the issue about how long were each of those days. Clearly, we know that this is a big issue in some people's minds. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the original text to suggest that those days were anything different from the 24-hour days that we have today. There was evening, the dark part of the day, and morning, the light part of the day. They made up each 24-hour period. If we really believe that God is omnipotent and they could have created our world with a snap of his fingers, why do we have a problem with his creating what he did on each day of creation a week? Surely in the brief space of the creation account in Genesis 1, the repeated use of the expression, there was evening and there was morning, should teach us that these were ordinary days. Look at, look at an example. Look at Leviticus 23, verse 3. You have six days in which to do your work, but remember that the seventh day, the Sabbath, the Sabbath, is a day of rest. Such verses as this should emphasize and reinforce the idea that there, were, uh, that there were days, I notice it's a misspelling here, of standard ordinary length. That they were days, I'm sorry, they were days, that's correct, of standard ordinary length. There is no evidence that the ancient Hebrews had any question about those seven days of creation week being anything other than days of ordinary length. Even many scholars who question other aspects of the creation account will admit that the wording of Genesis 1 implies literal days. By the way, and if you are interested in, in stirring up some questions in your Sabbath school class, you can have access to our handouts that we look at here uh, by going to our website, theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Yeah, evening and morning days kind of suggest a 24-hour yeah. period for me. So how should we deal with the wording of Genesis 1? If we feel confident in dismissing the obvious meaning of the wording, what are we implying? Are we suggesting that our knowledge and our wisdom take pre precedence over God's word? Yes, they are. Yes. Some the answer say, to that is yes. Yes, they say it's a sort of allegory. If, yes, if we feel confident yeah. in dismissing yeah. that. Yes. Well, look at a couple of verses in the Bible that some have tried to use. Psalm 90, verse 4. A thousand years to you are like one day. They are like yesterday already gone, like a short hour in the night. And then look at 2 Peter 3, verse 8. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. And people look at that and you see, so see, that just takes care of it. You know, the... <laughs> The, the seven days of creation a week are, are long time periods. Well, there's several problems with that. First of all, these passages suggest that time is no limitation for God. That's all it's saying. One day in his sight could just as well be a thousand days. A thousand years, I'm sorry. These verses have nothing to do with Genesis 1. It's not talking anything about creation. And certainly do not help those who think that we need billions of years for the evolutionary process. It doesn't say a billion years is like one day, it says a thousand years. If those six days of creation week were in actual fact long time periods, then we should see in the fossil record a matching succession, right? The first fossils should be plants, then there should be fossils of water animals and air animals, and finally we should find land animals. But this is not the sequence we see in the rocks. Water creatures come before plants, Land, land creatures come before air creatures. The fossils of fruit trees and other flowering plants come after these others. The only point of similarity in the sequences is that humans appear last in both accounts. You know, I would like for a scientist to be able to live millions of years and just sit there and watch that amoeba turning into a polywog and see if it ever does. Mm -hmm. And yeah. just sit there and watch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the only way they're going to know for sure that... Well, I think we'll have to wait until God speeds up the clock. <laughs> but we do have some interesting evidence, say in the insect world, in which insects were caught in tree amber, mm -hmm. a tree pitch as it were, and these were in layers that are down, way down. And you look at those insects in that amber, and they are exactly like the insects of today. 
they have beautiful compound eyes and and six articulated legs. They're exactly the same, even though they might be bigger. Even though the the fossil record would have them billions of years apart, with all the changes that should have happened, didn't do it. They're identical. They're identical. And now we can take that piece of amber and put a little hole in it, put it on our keychain. They're identical. That's right. And you'll pay big money for it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are a lot of them out there, especially with a yeah. good insect. The in good it. stuff comes from just one or two areas. What yeah. What do we say to scientists who use the idea that all uh, amino acid are left-handed to kind of talk about uh, common descent. Kind of well, hard. Well, I know. And, and, but the answer, my response to them is if, if God figured out a system that worked great, why invent a different system? Right. <laughs> if it was random, why would, why would everything be made left-handed? Yeah, exactly. If it was a random thing, there ought to be right and left-handed. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's designed. Yeah. Well, Ellen Weitz has some words about this, as you might guess. She says, of each successive day of creation, the sacred record declares that it consisted of the evening and the morning, like all other days that have followed. That's Patriarchs and Prophets, page 112. Then she goes on in well, another book, but the infidel supposition that the events of the first week required seven vast indefinite periods for their accomplishment strikes directly at the foundation of the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. It makes indefinite and obscure that which God has made very plain. It is the worst kind of infidelity, for with many who profess to believe the record of creation, it is infidelity in disguise. That's Volume 3 of Spiritual Gifts, page 91. Now, this, this is coming from my background, coming from seeing Sunday churches, who subdivide themselves according to if they disagree. Mm -hmm. What I just cannot understand is Seventh-day Adventist people who have the all this is set with the spirit of prophecy and stuff. And then they don't believe in creation and they still want to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. Why, like the Sunday churches, don't they become another denomination with, that meets on Saturday? I mean, I just don't understand the uh, glue that holds someone that wants to rip apart the church's mm -hmm. beliefs. Uh, yeah. But in Sunday churches, you just peacefully split and each go your own way. But many of those people, you, you know, you have a dysfunctional family. In families, oh, you yeah. may have an uncle that's really off his rocker, and you're, but you're still a family. <laughs> Why is it always the uncle? No, <laughs> <laughs> no but you're still a family. Some people are, are truly Adventists in their core, but they have questions that they don't have answers for. Oh, but And see, if they go speak with the wrong person, I've sat in room people have said things that just I just want to scream but at the same time there are things that I understand where a certain question comes from but you are probably talking about the ones that are so deviant and disrespectful and I don't understand why they're there just to create trouble well like in the Sunday churches there's the uh, Christian Reformed Church uh, decided that women were going to be um, deacons they're not even um, ordained just deacons mm -hmm. And so f the United Reform pulled apart because they didn't believe that. And so now they're all both happy in their own environment, believing consistently, like unified and, and less argument and fighting. And um, they go, and they're still family. They're, right. they, and they're relatives. Yeah. There's a culture, though, that everybody's grown up in. Um, and it's really hard that all of a sudden I don't want to be an yeah, Adventist you anymore. Adventist. You just can't move out mm -hmm. to the world well, because they do things differently well, out there and they, they end up coming back and they, they may still hang around everybody but they mm -hmm. still don't believe mm -hmm. the Adventists. I mean, I mean, it happens here. We have a Sabbath school here on campus that has atheists in, yes. in it. And, they're, and they've grown up in the Adventist church and they, they come here, I think, because they enjoy the culture. They're secular Adventists. Yeah, they're secular Adventists. <laughs> and they just won't, they won't go Adventist. and 
they won't go and just move in with uh, other. That a, destroys the strength of the church that wants to be a certain way. But don't everything. forget, that is the way it was prophesied to, to happen. Mm -hmm. If it if you are in a church where everybody is happy and perfect and, and they're wrong. not falling apart, run because <laughs> the last church is supposed to be that way. I find <laughs> it fascinating and wonderful that we have a church that different divergent ideas can be spoken about. It's a blessing. But also I've seen Adventists that have lost it. There's a young man that walk around, he's filthy. He just walk around and he, he has his instrument. And it breaks my heart because he walks around that allied health. Mm -hmm. and, and I know somebody know this man. And he's so dirty. He has no shoes and he's really filthy. And he's quoting scripture. And he has his little violin that, you know, it's kind of broken. Mental illness is different well, from the metamorphosis that every denomination on the face of God's earth has gone through and is going mm. through. It's the but gift. somebody could have went and got that man and said, okay, let's take you someplace where you could take a bath. Yeah. I think, I think he's been at potluck. <laughs> well, <laughs> even if you believe in some non-literal interpretation of Genesis 1, it should be clear that nothing, according to Genesis 1, was left to chance in the act of creation. There was no common ancestry of species. Darwinian evolution is in blatant contradiction with the Genesis account, even at its most basic level. Remember that science, with all its ongoing discoveries and challenges and changes in belief, has only a fallen, sin-polluted world to study. Is that important to remember in our understanding of origins? Let us try to summarize. In other words, we don't have the option of doing experiments on the Garden of Eden. It's not there anymore. Let us try to summarize what we have learned in this lesson. The real issue is one of interpretation. Will we allow Scripture to speak to us in its own terms? Or are we going to insist that we, re we will reinterpret Scripture in our terms or on our terms? It's even more than that. Will yeah. we allow Scripture to say it and also our spirit of prophecy to say it yeah. and disagree with Scripture, disagree with spirit of prophecy and say, we know better. Yeah. There are many examples of modern groups trying to reinterpret Scripture to better fit their own ideas. What does this tell us about their priorities? Let us look at some examples. A large group of Christians have interpreted the biblical terms of fire, hell, eternal, everlasting, and God's wrath to support the ideas of eternally burning hell. The truth as supported by many passages in Scripture is very different. Are we going to allow modern understandings of certain words to interpret, reinterpret Scripture into something it never intended to say? We must allow Scripture to interpret itself. As our lesson suggests, reinterpretation has been used to support the idea of Sunday sacredness. Once again, the Bible is clear if we read it while, reinter while interpreting Scripture using only other Scripture. Anyone who has seriously looked at modern science realized that it is continually in flux and change. Some new discovery, I mean, tomorrow morning the newspaper may talk about somebody who's discovered something new in the field of medicine or physics or chemistry, and, you know, it's big news and uh, everybody has to re-change re their thinking. So, what does this tell us about the permanency of scientific knowledge? By contrast, the Bible says that God does not change, Malachi 3.6. His word written thousands of years ago has not changed either. Why is it that we now want to treat God's word as flexible and changeable, and many want to treat scientific knowledge as inflexible and permanent? That's directly contrary to the facts. But science guides inquiry. Inquiry guides money mm -hmm. and things and, yeah. Yeah. So should we read the Genesis 1 account as a historical, literal account of seven consecutive contiguous days? Or should we read it as some allegorical or poetical presentation or something very different? The first question we should ask is, what did the biblical writers intend by what they wrote? There are two major answers to this question when we look at the Hebrew text. First, when the Hebrew word for day, which is yom, appears in the Old Testament with an ordinum, ordinal number, that's, that's numbers like first, second, third, those are ordinals, the combination always depicts a literal day. 
Additionally, the presence of evening, morning vocabulary in Genesis 1 makes it hard to escape the obvious. The author clearly intended us to read the account as a basic chronological history with real days like the days we experience now. Second, there's a Hebrew construction called the Wow, consecutive, which is a hallmark of Hebrew historical narrative. Wow is a conjunction that is generally the equivalent of and or but in English. The consecutive wow is used in a story that is repeated, it would, that is reporting sequences of consecutive events in historical narratives. In other words, a study of the Hebrew language in these verses makes it clear that Moses, when he wrote this down, was intending to re give us a historical thing. It's not a bit of poetry, it's not an allegory, it's a historical account may not be in the details we would like, but it's a historical account of the way he saw those things in his, uh, in his vision. Well, you know, also Moses talked to God in the burning bush and on Mount Sinai. I mean, who are we to uh, dispute what Moses heard from God himself? Yeah, really. Well, there are many stories in the Bible which are regarded as historical narratives. They use the same kind of language. Uh, when talking about days and sequences that are used in Genesis 1. Hebrew scholars agree that the original intention of Moses was that Genesis 1 be considered as historical narrative. Look at another example where G Jews and Christians, by their interpretation of Scripture, have turned things upside down. The Bible makes it very clear that sin is deadly. Genesis 2.17, Romans 6.23. By contrast, God is love, one to be loved. 1 John 4, 8, and 16. Thus, a careful Bible interpretation should lead us to love God and fear sin. sin. But when we look at the world around us, even the Christian world, what we find is that people love their sins and they fear God. How did that happen? Are we going to allow God to speak to us in, in His terms? Interpreting according to the way He intended? Or are we going to superimpose our own ideas as more valid than the literal historical narrative of Scripture. We're going to go on and we'll talk a lot more about origins and all they imply in the next 11 lessons, uh, next 10 lessons that we have in our series. But this should set the stage as suggesting through all of Scripture that what we have is a clear historical narrative of how things started. Think about that for this next week. See you next week.